Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. My name is Sean Furmage. I will be your host for this webinar. Before we start, feel free to participate at the bottom in our polls. Uh, if you have any topics that you'd be interested in hearing in the future, uh, we have a poll for that and you can enter your input. Also, as a reminder, our next webinar will be tomorrow, Wednesday, June 28th at 3 p.m. And that will be Understanding Immigration for Genealogists by James Tanner. Um, also, if you have any questions during today's presentation, there will be a pod on the side of the slideshow, on the right-hand side. And you're welcome to type any of those questions. We'll make sure they get answered uh, before the end of the webinar. Today, we will be pleased to hear from James Tanner, who will be giving a presentation titled Digitizing Documents, Mechanics and Methodology. James has a bachelor's in Spanish and a master's in linguistics from the University of Utah. He received a Juris Doctor degree in law from the Arizona State University. He worked for 39 years as an Arizona trial attorney. He previously owned a retail computer business and an Apple Macintosh software company. James has over 35 years of experience in genealogical research and is a blogger for Genealogy Star and the blog Rejoice and Be Exceeding Glad. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving here at the BYU Family History Library. He is the co-author or author of over 25 books on genealogical research and has presented at expos and conferences around the U.S. and Canada. James has seven children and 33 grandchildren. And we will go ahead and turn the time over to you, James. Howdy. This is James Tanner. Glad to be here for another BYU Family History Library webinar. Remind everyone that these webinars are recorded and uploaded to our BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. That's on youtube.com. Simply search for BYU Family History Library and you'll see that we have uh, close to uh, 300 videos up now. And with the upcoming videos, we should pass that shortly. Um, Today we're going to talk about digitizing documents, mechanics, and methodology. A um, little bit of detail here. This will be uh, this will have a little bit of a technical aspect to it because uh, some of that is is important to understand uh, before you begin doing uh, digitizing your genealogical records. Uh, first of all, we need to look at the idea of what is a digital image. Uh, uh, we're going to start pretty basic and then uh, work our way up into some a little more technical aspects of the problem. Uh, a digital image is an electronic representation of images that are stored on a computer. Uh, for example, uh, a series of numbers on a computer's hard drive. Uh, it, it's very hard for us in this digital age to think in terms of the vast streams of ones and zeros that are floating around the world. Uh, billions upon billions or probably trillions of little numbers that go in to make up the images that you see on the screen right now or any time that you're involved with your phone or, or any other electronic device that uses digital images. So these, uh, the idea here is to take a physical real object such as a document, a paper document or uh, a picture of a family or whatever it is and turn it into a format uh, that can be used and viewed on a computer and transmitted through uh, the internet or other connections to, uh, to, to different electronic devices. And the important thing about these images is that they can only be viewed on a screen. Uh, they can be printed off uh, onto paper uh, or some other media. Obviously, there are lots of ways. We just had uh, a family reunion and uh, uh, one of my daughters designed a logo for our family reunion and we had it printed on t-shirts. So I mean you go from the computer to a t-shirt, that's interesting. Uh, but uh, we can, you can have uh, any sorts of, of items can be moved to any other, other media. But primarily the basis here is that they exist in an electronic format so then you can email them, move them across the internet in a variety of ways or, and uh, electronically between uh, cell phones and things like that that uh, allow us to, to uh, manipulate and, and store these images in a, in a variety of methods. Uh, 
And the images that we view on the screen are made up of discrete little dots, or called pixels. Um, if, uh, if our memories go back that far, and I'm, I'm finding that the younger generation of my, uh, as I mentioned, we have 33 grandchildren, and, and uh, I am, uh, uh, one day I was surprised to find out from my grandson, I was uh, showing a bunch of pictures, and he looked at a picture and said, what's that? Grandpa and I said, uh, that happens to be a typewriter, and he said, never seen one before. And uh, literally, he had never seen a typewriter. He was like an uh, older teen. Uh, and now he's uh, here at the university, I'm sure he's seen a typewriter since then. But uh, So there are um, you know, a number of things like that that, that are surprising. But uh, if we go back in time, we, we are... Uh, those of us who started with old, uh, with the original uh, computers, uh, as I did back in the 19, early 1970s and the late 1960s, uh, we were very well acquainted with dots because the dot matrixes were uh, the only way you could make up pictures. In fact, when I started with computers, uh, pictures were uh, basically created by typing different patterns of letters and numbers on a piece of paper. And so there weren't even any anything called pixels or discrete little dots that made up the images. So that was the that was how those images evolved. So today we can look at a television screen, for example, if you walk into one of the larger big box stores like Costco or Walmart or or Best Buy or uh, Sam's Club or whatever, you'll see giant up to 64, 65 inch screens, TV screens with. Uh, uh, almost uh, realistic images uh, plastered across them. All that basically went back to creating an image with a dot. And uh, so base that's where we've evolved to today. And our, our digital imaging is all of that that you see. And now, in fact, you, we have digital imaged billboards. As I drive along the freeway, I see the billboards changing. And uh, so now we even have that. And, I, I would imagine that some of the movies that I've seen where you uh, where the whole environment of the city was saturated in images, I think it's probably going to happen in some places. Okay, so now we're going to get into some terminology here. The resolution of the image, meaning how fine the detail is, how, how clear it looks, how realistic it looks, is the number of those little pixels, the little dots per square inch. So that's... Uh, that's kind of uh, abbreviated with a, uh, a, an acronym called PPI, or pixels per inch. But uh, basically that, that resolution keeps increasing. Uh, we now have uh, a lot of different kinds of, of uh, video out there. The latest one that's being sold is called 4K or 4,000 uh, pixel images across the screen. Uh, per square inch on the screens, and we have uh, now 5K video coming out, 5,000 dots per or pixels per inch. So they're they're getting more and more uh, more higher and higher resolution um, on the the computer screens, and they therefore they become more uh, accurate. So if we were look at real close, if we if we zoom in on an image. Uh, that appears on a computer screen or uh, is any kind of representation made uh, by a dot made by a printer or whatever in our electronic age. Ultimately, it resolves down into little dots. And uh, uh, the way of the world is that these dots are square. <laughs> they're, they're not really round. They're not like, you know, splotchos. The old days, the pixels, the, the dots on a dot matrix printer, which were the ribbon printers with the wires that came out and hit the ribbon and made images almost like a typewriter, uh, were, uh, were kind of rounded. And actually, they were the faster the printer, the less round they were. They were more sort of elongated sort of splotches on the paper. But uh, today, these images are strictly square little pixels, they're called. OK. So this is a, a magnified image from an LCD screen. Uh, uh, the, uh, of the types of screens, we could get into that. Of course, it would have nothing to do with genealogy, so we'll forget that today. But uh, it gets really technical from that point on. Um, this is 
a uh, cutaway view, a graphic view of a uh, uh, digital camera. Uh, this is the primary method of, of getting information into a computer. Uh, whether it looks like this, like a handheld, uh, a traditional looking handheld camera, or if it looks uh, simply like a lens on the side of a box, it, uh, it can be uh, what the idea here is that the light uh, image comes through a series of lenses or some kind of lens on the front of the camera on your uh, smartphone or your, or your uh, cell phone that you have. Uh, almost every, without, without exception, almost every phone sold today in the United States has a camera built into it. Uh, if you have a very sophisticated cell phone, uh, known as a smartphone that connects to the internet, uh, by the way, about 80% of the country is uh, of the United States now owns a smartphone, according to uh, uh, the studies that have been done. And the estimate during 2017 is that worldwide they would be sell they're supposed to be selling six billion smartphones this year alone which means more than every man, woman, child, and dog in the entire world is going to have a cell phone, a smartphone access by the end of 2017. And uh, even, even in places where you wouldn't even think they traditionally had it connections to the internet, they still do. Now people are getting them and they're, they're almost universally using their smartphones for access to the internet. But uh, basically here we're looking at a camera and the, the, the important thing from our standpoint is that uh, down in the left-hand corner it says electronic sensor. Well, there's a little chip inside there. It's a silicone chip. Sometimes they're, uh, they're experimenting with different uh, substances besides silicone, but now they're, they're primarily that still. And that uh, chip is covered with uh, a, an array of little tiny sensors, little things that pick up light in varying degrees. And uh, those sensors then send an electronic signal to uh, the computer that's contained in the camera, which turns that into a series of ones and zeros that can be interpreted by any another computer as an image. So that's kind of the process here. It's uh, uh, you know, as Arthur Clark, Arthur C. Clark, the science fiction writer, said, any uh, sufficiently advanced technology appears to be magic. And uh, as far as making pictures with a camera, digital camera is concerned, for most people, that's just pure magic. It doesn't got anything to do with understanding the technology involved. OK, so that's the, the, the uh, camera. Uh, as genealogists, we're probably going to, all, we're probably going to be interested in, in scanning flat documents. So we have uh, you know, kind of an unlimited supply of letters and documents and certificates. and photographs and things like that that we'd like to scan. And the most uh, common way of doing that is with a flatbed scanner. It looks a uh, machine that looks a little bit like this. Um, by the way, flatbed scanners are now ridiculously cheap. Uh, you can buy a very high quality one that's more than, more than satisfactory for any need that a genealogist would have for uh, probably under $50 online. And they're the quality is just as good as anybody needs to do scanning for. That's brand new. We're not talking about a used machine. We're talking brand new machines for 50 bucks. So, you know, that may seem like a lot of money to some genealogists, but to some of us who have to buy gas, I think that doesn't sound, that sounds more like a, a tank full of gas than it does <laughs> a product that I'm going to use for a couple of years, a few years. Um, and when we look at the inside of a scanner, now, of course, that is a little bit more uh, of a diagram than what we had with the camera. But up at the top, we have the flatbed. That's the piece of glass that you put your document on. And then there's a mirror down there. There's a light, uh, a bar of lights, uh, usually now LED lights, uh, light-emitting diodes that are also electronic devices. Uh, if you've been to the store lately to replace a light bulb, you'll now know what LED lights are because they uh, are because the old tungsten uh, hot light bulbs that we used to have are now gone. They've been mandated out of existence by law, actually, and uh, 
all the light bulbs we buy now are LEDs, and that's what's sitting inside this flatbed scanner. It's uh, shining a light on your document, just like a copy machine, and that light uh, from the pattern that's created by that light image is, is uh, reflected in a mirror that then goes through a lens. The lens is uh, kind of a uh, like an old uh, uh, piece of triangular glass that we would sometimes use to break uh, light into uh, a prism into uh, different colors. But in essence, it produces almost the same kind of thing, but the not, not really a lot optically is not done. But then it goes to the same sensor that we have in the, in the camera, uh, a CCD, a charged coupled device, is what CCD stands for, uh, sensor that is sitting inside the flatbed scanner. These, the, 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 the structure here, the, the concept here, is the same in every single scanner. The details are in the type of, of uh, lights that were used. Originally, the lamps for these scanners were fluorescent lamps. And now they've gone to LED lamps. And they'll probably go to whatever the next, next uh, uh, type of uh, light emitting product that they create, as do the CCDs, which will change to some other type of sensor as sensors become uh, evolved through technology. And then that sensor device is sent to a little black box that turns it into ones and zeros and uh, puts it into a computer format that can be used by a computer. OK, so either way, what we end up with is a picture. And uh, then we come to the question of resolution. And I mentioned resolution as being the detail that you can see in a photograph or in, a, in a, uh, uh, any document that's been scanned. And uh, it's hard to represent that, by the way, on a computer screen. Because what you see on your computer screen is whatever your, the resolution of your computer screen. So it wouldn't matter what I put out. I could put out the highest resolution thing in the world, you'd still only see whatever your computer screen produced. So it doesn't really matter what the resolution is, only it does matter if you're going to try to preserve a document into the future. You would like to get all the detail. Uh, if, if, you, uh, if the resolution is so low that you can't tell the, the, who the people are standing in the image, then you've got a problem. If you've got a photograph and you scan it at such a low resolution that all the faces are blurred, then that doesn't work. So we want to know what the resolution is. So I've got kind of a graphic here that, that if you were able to see any differences. Now, if you focus, if you don't focus on how blurry it is, I mean, that's a kind of a subjective thing, is the blurriness because your eyes might be really bad like mine are. And uh, it's, so it's all blurry to me, so it doesn't matter. But if you look down along the bottom of this shot, you'll see that as you go from right, left to right, increasing the resolution, you'll see more detail. You'll see more things that, some things that don't show up at all, or hardly show up at all, as you go across the, the image. OK, so it could be better, but that's the idea there. Um, so if you're thinking about this, thinking about the fact if you're nearsighted and you're not wearing your glasses, what does the world look like? You know, it's sort of lovely, bl blurry, kind of fuzzy looking thing. And then when you put your glasses on, if they're good, you know, and if you still can see after you have your glasses on, which is not me, uh, then you can see a lot more detail. Uh, if I look at a photograph, uh, right now I'm looking at a, at a, bill, a bulletin board full of photographs. If I have my glasses off, I can see the bulletin board, but I couldn't possibly tell who was on there. When I put on my glasses, I still can't read the, the writing, but I can see the pictures. And so that's the difference uh, of what we're talking about when we're talking about resolution. And it's important to us because we need to have sufficient resolution so that the detail and the image is, um, is preserved. Now, speaking genealogically, uh, how many of us that go way back uh, into uh, many, many years of doing genealogical research have sat in front of a microfilm uh, reader and found a piece of microfilm that was not of high enough quality for us to read the image? We can magnify it. We can do lots of things with it, try to increase the contrast. 
and sometimes it's just the, the original image was just so bad that we could not possibly read it. And that is a resolution. That's what we're talking about. The higher the resolution, the more likely it is that, that the original information be preserved. Unfortunately, of course, we couldn't do anything with about the handwriting of these old record keepers. Uh, that, that was their problem and now ours. So we're, uh, the high resolution isn't going to solve the fact that we can't read their handwriting. Um, okay, we've got three acronyms here. We have DPI, LPI, and PPI, and uh, you'll hear them thrown around as you go out. If you were to go out and try to buy one of these machines, you're going to see somebody talking about DPI, LPI, and PPI. Um, and we're going to talk about each one of them. DPI is dots per inch, and it's, an, it's actually a holdover from dot matrix printers. It actually means it, today, in today's world, DPI is meaningless. There is no such thing. We don't have dots, and dots per inch doesn't mean anything. But what does it mean to in the what? Is it, why do they keep using it? Well, because it's a familiar term, and people can kind of relate to it. The idea of how many little distinct Im dots there are in an image going across is um, is part of that process. So uh, yeah, you're going to see it all the time but it's really not accurate and it really doesn't convey the image. It's more of a comparative type of measurement. Uh, so if I say something is 300 dots per inch and then I have something else over here, another device that I say is going at 800 dots per inch, then the assumption is that the 800 dot per inch item is, has a higher resolution, can capture finer detail than the lower DPI item, even though DPI doesn't mean anything. LPI is a standard for printers. It means lines per inch. And uh, if you've been involved in the print business, as uh, we have for years and years, uh, you know they read all this stuff at the beginning of these presentations about the stuff we've done, and they leave out all the stuff we've really done. Anyway, um, uh, my wife and I have been involved with and been operating a graphic design business for the last 35 years, almost 40 years. And we're intimately involved with printing and uh, producing items out through the printers. And printers are very much interested in what's called LPI, lines per inch. And they have standard measurements. They have a, a pre-printed high quality standard uh, that looks like a, a, a piece of paper or a piece of cardboard or, or now plastic with a whole bunch of different size lines on it. And that, uh, I should have reproduced one of those, but I didn't think it would show up very well on the screen anyway. But that is the standard for printers. And they're, uh, they're using ink, and they're putting ink down on paper, or they're putting uh, ink down on other substances. And so they're very much interested in the resolution of the images based on the on, uh, ink coverage by ink. Well, that sort of bleeds over into the idea of... of uh, scanning and uh, digitizing documents. But the real issue here is PPI, or pixels per inch, and that's what shows up on monitors or other displays. So if, you're, if your resolution is high enough for you to see on a computer display, meaning all the little light diodes that are emitting light within that screen, then you're going to be able to see your image. So that's the key here, is how, how much resolution do we have there. Now, what about the resolution of the human eye? Ultimately, we're going to be viewing all this with our eyes. And the question is, how, how much resolution do we have? Uh, where are the point, where, where do we go beyond what the human eye can see? Um, if, uh, you know, technologically, we have the ability to take pictures from outer space, uh, satellite images, and read license plates and telephone books from outer space. But will our eye be able to do that? I mean, if we're standing out there on that uh, space station and we're taking pictures of the Earth with a camera that can record, uh, you know, the, a license plate from outer space, uh, would we be able to see that same license plate with our eye? And the answer is, boom. Obviously not. <laughs> All we would see would be the Earth. We would not even know. We would not even be able to see the town where the car was located. You know, we couldn't even get down to that. Uh, and that's the resolution of the eye. What? Where are we really? Well, here's the answer. 
and you can read all that if you want to. to I'm not going to read it all to you. But uh, you could read all that. You can stop the video when it's on the video and look at it and read this whole thing. Or you can, you can also get the links to uh, the, uh, the information. But basically, your resolution of your eye is 4,400 by 2,600. And that, that's what, if you go out and look for TVs or you look for computer screens, they're going to throw these numbers at you. And just for a comparison, a MacBook Retina display is 2880 by 1880. And so you're at a, at a, at a, a MacBook Retina display is about roughly half of the resolution of your eye. Now, why does it look really so good? Because you really can't see that much detail with your eyes, even though your resolution is that great. This is the ideal resolution. Now, my eye resolution, is resolution without my glasses is probably like 100 by 400 or something like that. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it, so it really varies. And it varies with light conditions. It varies with all sorts of different things. But, but technically, you got to understand that your, light ha your eye has a limitation on how, how much detail it can see. And the advantage of putting the, the images on a computer is that uh, it's pretty obvious for genealogists is we can zoom in and expand it and blow it up so we can see it. And that is uh, one of the main reasons for, uh, for digitizing and looking at things. Here's another uh, com uh, important thing, though, and that is that a higher resolution automatically creates a larger file size. Well, OK, let's, let's explain that. The file is the, the container, if you will, that c contains the information that we look at. So we see a, a, a photograph recorded on our computer, and it says, you know, familyphoto.jpg, and we know that that's a, a file that contains a photo of our family. So we click on it, and a software program on our computer uh, reads that uh, file full of ones and zeros and turns it into an image on our computer. Uh, the idea here is the more resolution you have, the smaller the dots, the more information that's contained in that file, the larger the file size. Well, one of the problems that occurred historically with computers was that, that images always outpaced the recording, the, the storage devices initially. So we were able to create images that we could not store because we had we did not have storage devices large enough to contain the images. Originally, we had floppy disks, little floppy disks, a plastic contained thing with a piece of magnetic uh, coated tape tape inside, a uh, uh, piece of plastic inside of a piece of plastic, and. Uh, we recorded them on there, and there were uh, today most of my images that I record uh, uh, exceed the storage capacity of the largest floppy disk ever created. So, uh, in the hard drives uh, today, the the hard drive, the hard large the the hard drive that we bought uh, that I bought originally, which was a 40 megabyte hard drive from Apple, for by by the way about three thousand um, dollars was uh, it far exceeded by any number of, of photos that I've been taking in the last week. So I, could, I couldn't have even have stored one of my photos on that 40 megabyte hard drive. <laughs> so there's, you know, this is kind of the interesting way that the, the world works. But we understand that. Now, here's the thing that's happened, the, the reality of this. The reality of this is that today storage is so vast the amount of information that you can store on a on a, a hard disk drive that's the size of a paperback book is uh, is is incredible. Today, for example, you can buy an eight terabyte drive. That's eight thousand gigabyte drive for one hundred and seventy nine dollars at Costco. Just walk in, buy one, or order it on Amazon. And the price on those, by the way, is coming down like an avalanche. They are just dropping like ten dollars every month or so in cost. And it will be it won't be very long before you'll be able to buy uh, huge, huge amounts more storage than you could ever take. You could take photographs all day long, every day for the rest of your life, and not fill up the drive. 
So, you know, these are the kinds of things. So today, storage isn't a question. And, and the fact that we have, they, they create a larger fly, file size uh, is only the concern of those people who, um, who do not uh, take the time to go out and check to see what they can get, they can get for a rather reasonable price on, uh, on storage. So uh, for the fact that I have uh, uh, well over a million files on my computer uh, is, is inconsequential to me because I can buy storage so cheaply and I can pay a few dollars a month and uh, upload a, a copy of, of my uh, vast records to uh, an online storage facility that stores everything I have for like five bucks a month. So, you know, this is, uh, storage is no longer a major concern. Okay, so now we're talking about the difference between clarity, sharpness, and contrast. These are all different terms there. And the first one here is sharpness, and that's the degree of focus or the ability to see additional detail. That's what the eye doctor is testing you when he puts the, the thing over one eye and then tells you to read the letters on the wall. Uh, that's sharpness, and that's the degree of resolution that your eyeball has uh, to, uh, to create an image that can be distinguished. Uh, if you're like me, you always get down to a line where it's totally fuzzy and you can't ever see anything. That's when you, that's where, that's the, the maximum uh, amount of sharpness that your eye is able to resolve. Now, sharpness in a photo or in a document is the distinct difference between the, different, the light and darkness. So if I have a real fuzzy image of a letter, I may not be able to read it. But if it's sharp, I can see the outline very clearly and read that letter very easily. I might be able to read a fuzzy image, but it, it's not comfortable. Contrast is the, is the difference between light and darkness, the darkness between adjacent spaces. They might not be, they might be very bright and very dark, like white and black, or they can be different shades. So the, the more contrast there is, that means the greater the, the, the difference in the uh, amount of color saturation or the amount of, of light and different colors. So uh, if you put uh, a blue letter on a dark blue background, there's no contrast, so you can't see it. If you put a black letter on a white background, there's high contrast and you can see it. So that's, that's why that's important. Clarity is completely subjective. It's uh, a, a measure of the clearness or visibility and uh, uh, usually involves an extended color range, meaning the more color you have, the more ability to reproduce the colors, the more shades that you can see, uh, then the, the, uh, the, more, the clearer the image is. Um, it's hard to say this because it is very subjective. What is a clear image to me may be totally incomprehensible to you. You can look at something and not even be able to distinguish what it is. So clarity is, is something that's a very subjective type thing. Okay, what is a good resolution for scanning? Okay, now we're down to the, we've got through the ideas that we have. These are the concepts that go along with uh, what we're trying to do and reproduce documents and photographs and all that and uh, maintain that, that library of, of uh, images that we've created. But the, the basic line here and the most common question I get is, well, what am I supposed to be scanning at? Okay, well, let me tell you what. You can get into the literature online. You can look up scanning resolution, and you can find everything. I mean, you can get every spectrum. You could, if you read enough, you'll think that you have to go out and buy a new scanner because your scanning resolution isn't up to what the, the latest, latest scanning thing is. And that's a whole different discussion. And, and we might do a, a, I've done some writing and some presentations in the past on this, but I, we might be able to get into that. It's a little really kind of technical, a very technical discussion, and it usually makes everybody go to sleep. But um, the, the, the resolution uh, for scanning uh, it is, has fat, the, the scanners and uh, have passed any conceivable practical need that we have for that high resolution. We have absolutely no reason to have that for preserving what we're trying to do 
with um, our documents. And important to understand that scanning resolution does not equal clarity. You can't you can scan at the highest possible resolution of any scanner that you or any device that you have. If the original document is unreadable, you're going to get an unreadable high resolution scan. So there's <laughs> what the point, you know. In other words, you 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 only can only reproduce what you've got. You can't add information to the document that you're looking at. Okay. So the problem here is that when you get into to excessive resolution, if you keep adding higher and higher resolution to your scan to a scan of a of a photo or of an image, particularly photographic images, if you keep hi higher and higher resolution, you run into what's called Mori patterns. Uh, the Mori pattern, M-O-I-R-E pattern, is uh, what happens when you uh, get too high a resolution. You see that when you see an oil slick on a, on a water and you get colors, or when you look at a screen, a window screen, and you see patterns in a window screen. And I'll show you one in just a second. But past a certain point, increasing the resolution doesn't re increase anything more than the file size. So all you get is a bigger and bigger file. You don't really get any more information out of the photo. There's a Mori pattern, folks. <laughs> That's what that looks like. And if you look at this and move your head back and forth, it'll look like the picture's moving. And it isn't. It's absolutely static. But that's that's what happens when you increase the resolution. And you'll see that the lines begin to disappear as they get towards the center of that pattern because the moray just basically interferes, is the interference of the light rays. And so you'll see patterns and movements that are not really there. And that's the moray effect that occurs when you try to jam too much resolution into your photos. Um, so let me ask the question again, what resolution should I use for scanning? Okay, what should I do? And here's the, here's the rule. Okay, we're going to go to the Library of Congress and Preservation Directorate of the Library of Congress. Um, I go back to them. They're sort of the clearinghouse for all the record preservation that's going on in the Library of Congress, uh, the, the standards used by the National Archives, and most of the archives around the world look to the Library of Congress for uh, at least not imposing a, a standard for, uh, for, for digital reproduction, but at least articulating the standard that's been accepted by the archivists around the world. OK, so this is the document. It's Technical Guidelines for Digitizing Cultural Heritage Materials Creation of Raster Image Files. That's the name of the document. I've got a link there to it on my, on my you can look it up. It's there on the Library of Congress. And the Preservation Directorate is a marvelous source of information on preserving all sorts of everything from comic books to, uh, to photographs of antiques to uh, cultural items of all kinds, all documents and records and paper and books and newspapers and everything else. They have standards and they have explanations on what they expect, how do they expect to preserve all that. Here it is, folks. The recommendation is 300 PPI to 400 PPI for all the scans. Okay, so you go to your store, you walk in, and they say, this scanner has 88,000 PPI. Big deal. 300 PPI does it, folks. That's what they scan everything at the Library of Congress, National Archives. What about photos? Everybody comes up and says, well, you've got to do higher on photos. or you, well, but you can keep going higher. You get more array patterns, and you get a larger file size. If you want to, if you want to print a, a, bulletin, a billboard, you know, 20 feet by 40 feet, that might take a little bit more of a file size than if you want to print an 8.5 by 11 high-resolution photograph. OK, 300 DPI is aimed at reproducing 8.5 by 11 images. That's how it works. OK, now if you're doing low volume scanning, I mean, you know, every once in a while you're scanning, you have 500 uh, photos to scan, or you're, uh, you know, some people come in and they say, well, I have 500 photos to scan. And I go, well, yeah, man, uh, that's, you know, for some of us, that would be a, a great blessing. 
I've, I, we have not run out, and I have in, in well over 150,000 on the way to 200,000 scans, and we're still scanning away. And we just got boxes, boxes of more documents that my, my daughter brought up to me from Phoenix that somebody in our families decided that I needed. And so, you know, this is not going to end. We're just going to keep doing this forever. Okay, now what do we scan to? Well, file, file formats, there's probably 50 to 100 different file formats out there. The ones that are used primarily are three types, and they're all very well accepted by the Library of Congress. JPEG images, JPG, JPEG is a standard type of, of file. TIFF, T-I-F-F, -F, is a larger file size. They're more, it preserves more of the information, and there's also what's called the portable document file format or PDF files from Adobe, and they are also acceptable. All three of these formats. PDF file really isn't a file format. It's a, uh, a way of, of, of encapsulating a file so that it can be read by a huge number of devices. But, the, but any one of these is just fine. Now, what about JPEG versus TIFF? The old argument was TIFF files were larger and so used up more file space. The answer is that I've already answered is we don't care anymore. Uh, we've got more storage than we could than we'll ever need, and so we'll just do it at whatever we can. Uh, all three of these, by the way, will be accepted by FamilySearch.org in their memory section. All three of these uh, can be uploaded to most of the major uh, uh, online programs. So we're just, you know, these are the ones we would probably use. Now, what about if we have a lot of documents? Now, meaning thousands of pages of documents. You may want to investigate uh, high volume scanning. This is a representation of what's called a sheet fed scanner. Uh, it's kind of like a copy machine, but instead of copying, it makes a, a, a digital image of the documents. We have this uh, magic time here. Scanning here. Um, some of these scanners, uh, like the ones we have here at the Brigham Young University Family History Library, uh, will scan as many as uh, in excess of 50 to 60 pages per minute. Uh, and you can scan a, a 400, I've scanned 400 page uh, manuscripts, uh, loose 8.5 by 11 manuscript book, double sided in a matter of maybe 10 or 15 minutes. So these are, you know, these can be very fast, and depending on the on your needs, you can get these. I scan so many documents, and it takes me so long to work through them that I have a flatbed scanner on one table next to my wife's computer, and I have a sheet fed scanner attached to my computer, which cost me, by the way, three hundred and fifty dollars from Epson uh, as an Epson scanner, and it does a, a tremendously good job of all of the correspondence and everything else that I need to digitize to send to people. So once again, we scanned a JPEG, TIFF, or PDF. And uh, as a preparation for scanning, uh, we want to carefully remove staples, paper clips, and other paper fasteners. OK, well, there was our announcement. Um, you can carefully make sure you carefully remove staples, paper clips, or other paper fasteners. Uh, all they do is destroy your span, your uh, your scanner. Uh, if you forget that, you'll the first time you forget it, you're excused. The second time you forget it, you've got a real problem. But uh, it's not impossible that you put a big stack of paper into a sheet fed scanner, and all of a sudden you go and you get this huge mass of paper with paper clips and Everything's jammed in there, and it takes you a while to straighten. And also ruins the original document, by the way. So there's some uh, some very good reasons for making sure that the paper is ready to go in. Uh, it's a good idea to sort the documents by physical size and try to scan the documents of the same size together. That just makes life easier for you. There are scanners. We have a Kodak photo scanner out of here that's uh, kind of a high end. It's about six or seven hundred dollars. Uh, and uh, that scanner will take all sizes of photos up to about eight inches, and um, it, it automatically 
keeps them from getting crooked and straightens all the images and everything. It's amazing. So you can just stack everything in there without worrying, and it just runs it all through. But uh, that's the exception, and that's higher end and a little more expensive scanners. Uh, choose your file type and resolution. Uh, I suggest you're still at three to four hundred DPI, and your file type. Uh, if you don't, if you don't know anything more, you can use either PDF or, or JPEGs. Both both are going to help be helpful. If you're uh, going to do a lot of file editing of the images, I would recommend TIFFs. Those are the ones you can edit uh, without having any uh, problems. If you are going to edit photos or documents uh, after they're scanned, make sure you never touch your original. Always do your editing on a copy. Don't ever try to... You don't want to have to go back and rescan everything, so make sure that you always have your original, co your original scan and then you make a copy of that scan uh, to do any editing. Okay, make sure your scanned copies are being filed into the right storage folder or device. Uh, we have that problem in the library constantly uh, with people who come in and scan 500 photos and then can't figure out where they've gone. And we have to spend some time. And they think they're going on to their flash drive, and they're not really. They're just going off into space. So, And they may have to end up rescanning all the documents. So you just have to be careful to understand where your, pro where your photos are going. And believe me, this is something that comes up constantly. I invariably when I uh, download photos from a camera to my computer, the computer decides to put them into a file that's buried someplace in the in the operating system and I have to go find it and move it back out and put it into my hard drive or wherever I'm storing the documents. So it's it's something that happens and it's a constant kind of background issue with, with doing scanning. Now what about using a camera for doing your digital copies? Well yeah, and the answer is obviously. You have cameras available if you have a cell phone and a smartphone today. Um, I have an iPhone and I use it routinely to take photos and I also use it routinely to take pictures of, devi of, of uh, documents. Uh, and that is a, uh, a very uh, efficient and good use of resources. The problem is lighting, is how you're going to light the object. Because if you're taking pictures of paper or photographs with a camera, uh, you have a problem with hot spots. That is, the, any amb ambient light will seem to make a, a part of the image that looks like a, a flare or, a, or lighting on it. But the way you get around that is, is having a camera stand or a light box. So on the left you have a camera stand where you uh, the upright bar there in the center is a mounting for your camera. That makes it easy to get the camera at uh, uh, exactly perpendicular and horizontal to the uh, uh, surface of your document. And then you have lights that can be placed to avoid uh, hot spots so you get Im even illumination across the whole document. And these are, you know, these are. This is a camera stand that would cost anywhere from around, <laughs> oh, maybe eighty to one hundred and twenty, one hundred and fifty dollars on up, depending on how complicated they get. On the other hand, we have a, on the right hand side, we have a, a, a representation of a light box, and that's what that does is is just basically a, a translucent substance in here, some kind of white plastic or whatever that. Uh, uh, is used to diffuse the light and avoid uh, light spots. Most of the commercial photography you see of objects today are taken in light boxes. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the purview of the commercial photographer. Um, fortunately for genealogists, some of the light boxes that are now being advertised um, for genealogists genealogical use and showing up at the con at uh, conventions such as the shot box uh, which is a, a device to, designed for genealogists and preservationists uh, are relatively inexpensive they're still uh, and you can make one at home uh, there's a lot of DI, uh, DIY stuff online on YouTube and that for constructing light boxes so uh, there's ways to get around uh, coming up with a big expense, but it takes a little work. 
Now, what about megapixels? What are megapixels? You'll see that uh, coming out with cameras all the time. Um, documents lead, and, and this is kind of a rule of thumb. Uh, for a camera to work as well as a scanner, and, and that's been kind of my question over the years, is do I want to take a picture with my camera or do I want to take the time to make sure that I scan it properly with a, with a flatbed or a other kind of scanner. In order for a, f a photo a camera to give me a the same resolution as a flatbed scanner, about 300 dpi, I need a 10 megapixel camera. Now that's you know, seems very far along as far as historically with cameras are concerned, but today uh, every every new um, uh, smartphone camera is at least 10 megapixels. There's not, you, I don't even think you could buy a smartphone camera anymore. Every little Canon and Nikon and, and Kodak and every other kind of little uh, point and shoot camera that you buy today for $100 or $50 or whatever is more than 10 megapixels. It's kind of the th threshold. In fact, the average today is 12. So most cameras that you're going to buy today are going to be um, uh, sufficient for taking pictures of documents. What about photographs? What if I'm taking a photo of a photo? Okay, now that's a really, uh, that's different. And I've been working with it for years, and it wasn't until the cameras reached 20 megapixel cameras before I was able to get similar quality from a camera image taken with my camera as I could with a flatbed scanner. Now the difference here is price. Flatbed scanner cost me 50 bucks. I can spend $200 on a flatbed scanner or $300 if I want to scan slides and other things. But primarily I could get by with a, with a good flatbed scanner for $50 to $100. I can't, right now, 20 megapixel cameras start at about $300. So I can buy a Sony or a Nikon or a Canon uh, they're called prosumer. They're between professional and consumer cameras, and they uh, they're more than 20 megapixels, and they um, they're running around 350 to 400 dollars, 500 dollars max. To go higher than that, obviously, I can go much higher than that with with various cameras, and that is a function of price. Today, uh, the high end uh, Canon and Icon. Uh, Sony cameras are running around uh, five to six thousand dollars, seven thousand dollars for the camera body without any lenses. So you really have to be kind of into the professional range if you want to take pictures of photos. You're not you're not really into consumer level type stuff. Plus, it's very difficult to get a good photo of a uh, photo from a camera. So that can be kind of a difficulty. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, light, lightning needs to avoid the hot spots. So what about post-production? So now I've gone in, I've taken a bunch of pictures and scanned a bunch of documents, and now I have a huge pile of property. Uh, the question is, can I throw away all my photos? Uh, please don't do that. That is absolutely gives the you know cold sweat and shakes to, to genealogists to find out that they're going to throw away all the old photos. Um, so keep and properly store all the original photographs, even if you have scanned them. The advantage of, di of digitization is being able to share and be able to uh, upload these photos and preserve them, but we don't want to get rid of the originals. And we organize our documents and photos. Uh, the simplest way to do that is by date or numerically. In other words, the first photo you take is number one, the second photo you take is number two, and you give it a description and you put it on a computer and then you can search and find anything you need. Uh, we do have another, um, a, num a couple of other uh, BYU Family History Library videos on uh, organizing your files and to get into a lot more detail on that subject. So you can look those up. Make sure you tag all the people in the photos. Let people know who they are so when you die, they don't have to try to do detective work to figure out who you're standing next to and who this person is and what's going on. And my last suggestion is <coughs> FamilySearch has provided us a way that we can freely 
uh, free for free, we can upload uh, virtually an unlimited number of our family search document of our documents and memories and photos to family search uh, and they'll be maintained as long as family search exists, which as long as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints exists, which is probably till the end of the world. So uh, if you're worried about uh, preservation at all, uh, a good place to start is to upload your your files to the family search memories. And we have free, permanent, organized, and shared by tagging into the family tree, uh, which makes these very, very accessible to all of your relatives and, and your descendants for generations. A uh, couple of little kind of technical notes here at the end. Um, I am going to stop talking. Um, the uh, uh, we scan or photograph the entire pages of an album and then go back and scan the individual photographs. So uh, why do I do that? Uh, because photograph al photographic albums are selected by the individual who created the album. So the, the photos are grouped as they are related. And so if, uh, if I preserve that whole page first and then do the individual photos, at least if I can go back and see what how the person originally had them in their photo, in their album. If I start out by pulling all the photos out of the album and then scanning them, I've just lost uh, the context of how the original how they were originally organized, either either chronologically or subject or whatever else the person did, however they did. Uh, that may, for example, here uh, I have six photographs. I may have no clue in the world as to when or where these pictures were taken. But by looking at all six photographs, I may be able to not only identify the people, but I might also be able to identify the place and the uh, reason why these photographs were taken. But if I scan them individually, I may never be able to put these all six photos back together in one place that gives me that same set of evaluation information. So to preserve the sequence and organization, make sure that you preserve album pages, scrapbook pages, everything like that. And you know, sometimes it's necessary to remove the photos from the scrapbook in order to scan them properly, but I would suggest scanning them individually and leaving them in place in the scrapbook or in the album. Um, some of these albums have, uh, are a disaster. Uh, people glued down their photos with glue, and that's you know, removing the photo will destroy the photo as well as the album. So we want to make sure that we scan them in place. So preserve them, then scan the individual photos individually. Uh, scan the individual pages of documents. Um, as you scan those documents, combine the files into one PDF file per document. Um, there are a number of programs out there that will take uh, PD, uh, individual JPEG or, uh, or TIFF files and, uh, or individual PDF files and put them into one whole document file, PDF file. Uh, the, 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 prop, the, the basic program for that is Adobe Acrobat Pro, which is a pretty expensive program, but is uh, if you're involved in this kind of process and you're doing working with a lot of documents all the time, you'll find that it's uh, a very useful and almost indispensable program to have around. Um, transcribe the handwritten documents as my suggestion. Uh, there's uh, a couple of new programs that assist in that transcription progress process. One of them is called Kindex, K-I-N-D-E-X, uh, and there are others out there that help you uh, assist you in transcription. But it basically is a situation of just uh, getting in and uh, reading the, the handwriting and typing out the, the uh, transcription so that the document can be scanned, uh, excuse me, searched. And uh, the word process that a computer would be able to go in and search the document. As it sits there, this handwritten document cannot be searched by a computer as, as, as we speak today. That could change in the future as handwriting recognition becomes more and more available. Uh, OK, the, my last point I think here is to overcome the clean it up and throw it away mentality. Please do not do that. This is not part of the genealogical world. 
Uh, we have to give up some of the things, and one of the things we give up when we become gene genealogists is the idea that all this stuff is junk and that it, we, we view it as being very, very valuable junk. And so it needs to be preserved and not thrown away. So don't throw this stuff away. It gives me the, you know, the heebie-jeebies to think about all the stuff that's been thrown away in the years. Oh, by the way, some of it can be thrown away. I mean, let's not keep napkins. Let's not keep, you know, programs from, uh, you know, things that don't even mention anybody in our family type stuff. I mean, you know, we don't need all the parking tickets. We don't need everything. All that stuff, a lot of that stuff can go away. What we do need, though, is the genealogically pertinent information. So as we find a place to store the documents and the photos, make sure they're preserved properly. And like I mentioned earlier, Library of Congress uh, Protection Directorate has all the information on every classification of, of document and record that needs to be preserved. Digital storage is now very inexpensive. I mentioned that and we'll mention it again. Do not be afraid of going down to Costco or to Best Buy or online to Amazon or any other place you want to find it and looking for, for storage devices. Uh, they're they're relatively cheap for more storage than most of us will ever need. Eight terabytes, 179 bucks at the time. Uh, it may have gone down since I did the this this uh, presentation. So remember, find a home for your heritage. Thanks for watching. Remember that these uh, videos are uploaded to the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. We invite you to subscribe to our channel. The reason we keep telling people to subscribe is simple. Uh, the visibility of the videos increases the more subscribers we have. So the more people who subscribe, the more people are going to be able to know that we have these videos out there. And since we're doing this, we just like to be heard once in a while. So if you subscribe and get all your friends to subscribe, then we have uh, uh, more visibility with uh, Google, and uh, we get uh, more people to, to be aware that we're talking here. Thanks again. Perfect. Thank you, James. Um, like he said, we will have these uploaded to YouTube shortly, um, so you're welcome to, to view it again, or if you'd like to share it with others, that's a perfect way to do it. Um, if you'd like to make any comments as to your feedback for today's webinar or any topics you'd like to have covered in the future, uh, feel free to answer those in the polls down below um, before you exit today. And we thank you again for joining us for our webinar series.